Hey, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk to Dr. Travis Timmerman, and we are going to discuss the badness of death. All right, Travis, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Travis. I work in the philosophy of death and some areas in ethics, uh, normative and applied. And uh, we're going to talk a bit about my favorite view of the badness of death, which is called deprivationism. And the view holds at bottom that the extent to which your death is bad for you is determined by the extent to which your death deprives you of additional good life that you would have lived had you not died when you did. So that's kind of an abstract formulation, but I think it's very helpful to think about this in the context of first order cases or various examples. Uh, so suppose hypothetically and hopefully f falsely <laughs> uh, that I die in a car crash later today. And suppose furthermore that had I not died in that car crash, I would have gone on to live, you know, let's say another 40 years and then maybe died of cancer. According to the deprivation view, my death uh, would be bad for me to the extent that that additional 40 years of life would have been on the whole good. So the better that life would have been, the worse my death is for me, the worse that life would have been, the less bad or perhaps even good my death would be. Yeah, no, thank you for that clear explanation. And I think it makes a lot of sense. It's quite intuitive because I think for most people, we think that it's more tragic when a child dies than someone who's very old, right? Because someone who's like, you know, 95, it's just like, well, they wouldn't have lived that much longer anyway, yeah. whereas a child has their entire life ahead of them. Uh, I think... Deprivationism can be shown to be like almost certainly the true view. Unlike most philosophical views, I have a very high credence or confidence that this is the correct view. And I think people are intuitively um, disposed to accept deprivationism. But one objection to the view, and you just put your finger on something very important, I think, is that the death of a young child seems much more tragic. Uh, than the death of an elderly person, at least in typical cases. And if you want to explain how tragic a death is in terms of how bad it was for the person who died, then the deprivation view is not able to generate those sort of intuitive judgments in every single case. And the reason for that is because while typically the death of a young child deprives them of more good life than the death of an elderly, that's not always true. So my uh, wife used to work for the Make-A-Wish Foundation uh, when I was in graduate school. And then before that, when we lived in Arizona, most of those kids thankfully survived and lived well into adulthood. But there were lots of children who died quite young from cancer. Some of them had multiple life-threatening illnesses. So let's consider one of those types of cases where a child dies. I think you used the example of a 10-year-old let's say it's from one of their life-threatening illnesses. But suppose it's also true that had they not died from that life-threatening illness, they would have died a short time later, maybe a year, or two, or something like that, uh, either from that illness um, or from one of their other uh, comorbidities that threaten their life. On a standard deprivation view, their death was only bad for them insofar as it deprived them of that amount of additional life they would got, which I'm just stipulating as a year or two in this hypothetical case. And then there can be cases where someone who is I think, used a 95-year-old, had they not died at 95 from, I don't know, let's say kidney failure, uh, maybe they would have been able to live another five years and made it to 100. Then assuming just for the sake of argument that each year of the life that's missed out on is equally good for the, for the child and for the 95-year-old, then the 95-year-old's death would be more than twice as bad for them as a 10-year-old's death would be for the 10-year-old. But it certainly seems a lot more tragic that the 10-year-old died than the 95-year-old. Okay. So that's the uh, kind of objection to the view. And here's the response that I want to give on behalf of the deprivationist. The deprivation view of the badness of death is just a view about how bad the event of your death is for you. It's neutral with respect to whether there's other considerations that factor into, say, how tragic we think it is that someone died or what our moral obligations are with respect to preventing people from dying. Um, and there are other considerations that seem relevant for those judgments. 
So the deprivation is, isn't is committed to saying that these other considerations that I think are relevant are in fact relevant, uh, but it doesn't preclude that either. So for example, there just seems to be something deeply unfair or unjust about a 10-year-old that gets so much less life than everyone else. And that could be something that might contribute to how tragic a death is, even though it's true that the young child's death in this case was less bad for that child than the elderly person's death was for them. Um, and that's just one example, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of other considerations. There's a plethora that we could go through that might factor into how tragic we think a death is that comes apart from uh, simply how bad it was for the person who died. Okay. Now, I think it's good that you made that distinction because the way that I was framing it, well, the way that I was understanding tragedy is the badness of the death for that particular person. And I think in general, right, we assume that children are going to live longer. They have more future life than elderly people. And so that's why generally we think it's more tragic. But then there is this other element to it that may contribute to to the tragedy, and that's some sort of unfairness, right? But deprivationism doesn't have to say anything about fairness, right? It's right. only account of the badness of death. Yeah, it's only account, to use the technical terminology of philosophy, it's only account of how prudentially bad someone's death is for them. Um, it's not even an account of like how bad someone's death is, all things considered, or from the perspective of the universe, or how bad it is morally. I mean, all of these are sort of different value judgments that the deprivation view is strictly speaking uh, neutral with respect to. Yeah, that makes sense. And what I like about deprivationism is that it can explain why death can be good for someone. I think a lot of people find that intuitive, right? Like if you're a spy and you, you're now a prisoner of war or something like that, and you're just going to be tortured for the rest of your short life, it seems that an earlier death would be good for you. Right. Yeah. So if you have a little cyanide capsule hidden in your mouth as part of you know this gear that you were given as a spy, and you're about to just be tortured to death, and you bite down on the cyanide capsule, and let's say that results in your immediate and let's say painless death, uh, the deprivation view would say, in this case, your death was good for you, assuming the torture would have been so bad as to constitute life that's not worth living, as below the zero level for well-being. And... It can, they can also say it's very tragic that you didn't get to live and not be tortured for much longer. But nevertheless, your death was good for you in this case. And I agree with you that that's an advantage of their view, and it's an often overlooked advantage, in my opinion. One reason that I think it's advantageous is because deprivationism is able to preserve the link between how good or bad your death is for you and the prudential reason that you have to seek or avoid death at the time in question. At least it is able to do that better than alternative accounts of the badness of death. So one um, you know, competitor of you, maybe the main one, is known as Epicureanism. And they hold that your death can never be bad for you under any circumstances. And they have a, you know, various arguments for that that I'm happy to get into. Uh, but the thing is, if that's the case, then it's of no sort of relevance, seemingly, to your sort of practical deliberation about when uh, you should seek or avoid death. But obviously, there are things that matter um, when we're deliberating about whether we should seek or avoid death at one time. So if you're that spy, it matters that if you don't end your life now, you're going to be tortured to death. That gives you a reason maybe to end your life. Or to take a more frequent example, the bioethics literature, if you're terminally ill and you're just suffering in immense pain. What your perspective life would look like if you continue living, let's say if you decide to undergo additional treatment or you're thinking about physician-assisted suicide. Uh, it matters what your life would be like if you continue. Um, and then, of course, if you're thinking about doing things now that are risky, if I think, oh, I wonder if I should go bungee jumping or, you know, try to hop roofs on cities or, you know, do things that are very dangerous. One thing that matters prudentially, whether it's worth taking that risk, is what my life would look like uh, if I continue living. And the deprivation view captures that by tying how good or bad the event of your death is to you to what this other life would be like. And other views that do away with this, that don't pay any attention to this counterfactual question about what your life would be like in assessing the prudential value of the baddest of your death, uh, they either have to say completely wacky things about what's prudent to do with respect to your death, which none of them do, or they really say the same thing that the deprivationist is saying. They just use different terminology. So I'll say this one last, like the Epicureans will say, oh, well, your death isn't bad for you, but it prevents you from missing out on more good life. And that means that you should continue living. But once you say that, then I think, well, you're just really 
saying the same thing that the deprivation is to say, and you're just not using the terms good for and bad for. No, thank you for that. I remember the first time that I encountered the term was when I was assigned to comment on one of your papers. No, I was just you know sitting next to the window reading your paper, and you uh, ex- summarized Epicureanism. And I had never encountered that view prior to that, and it just blew my mind. It blew my mind because it sounded plausible as well, right? If, if I remember correctly, the argument is like, well, for something to be bad for you, it has to be bad for you either when you're alive or when you're dead. But death isn't bad for you when you're alive because it hasn't affected you yet. Death is not bad for you when you're dead because by then you don't exist. Therefore, death can't be bad for you. Uh, Yes, that's a very nice summary of the so-called timing argument for the view. So that's one of the most popular arguments that they give in defense of the view that your death cannot be bad for you. Uh, In each premise that you just went over that generates that conclusion does seem quite intuitively plausible. I think part of the intuitive plausibility relies on the fact that the term harm or bad for is ambiguous and it's used in different contexts to mean different things. And the Epicurean can get some mileage from implicitly and perhaps inadvertently moving between different understandings of good for and bad for. And then the other reason that I think it seems intuitive is the implications of the view are not transparent. And once you really think through what accepting each premise commits you to, then I think they become much less plausible. Let me just make good on uh, or justify my claim that they're trading on different senses of bad for. So it's common for philosophers to distinguish between what's called like intrinsic badness and extrinsic badness. So something that's intrinsically bad is bad in and of itself for you, or something that's extrinsically bad is not bad in and of itself, but because it leads to something that's intrinsically bad or prevents you from getting something that's intrinsically good. Uh, So that's abstract, but you might think, very common, I think widely accepted example is that pain is a very good candidate for something that's intrinsically bad for me. It's bad in and of itself. It could lead to good things. It could be extrinsically good. Maybe getting a shot, feeling the pain, that's not good for me, but it's good because it prevents me from, say, getting COVID if it was a COVID vaccine. Uh, Whereas extrinsic badness could just be bad because it prevents me from getting something that would be good as one example. So uh, if you were to steal a present that had been mailed to me, unbeknownst to me, um, that would at least be extrinsically bad because it prevents me from getting the joy that I would get if I opened the present and, and yeah, liked what I got. So uh, the deprivation view is a view that death is extrinsically bad for you. It's not a claim that death is intrinsically bad. It's just extrinsically bad insofar as it prevents you from accruing additional intrinsic goods. So when the Epicurean says that if something's bad for you, it must be bad for you at a time. That sounds quite plausible to me if we're talking about intrinsic bads, especially if we're inclined to think the thing that's intrinsically bad, the sole thing that's intrinsically bad is pain, as hedonists do, if you think that. Uh, Then that claim sounds very plausible. But that's not going to rule out deprivationism. To rule out deprivationism, you need to hold the view that for something to be uh, extrinsically bad for you as well, it must be bad for you at a time that you exist. And that claim, I think, is not intuitive. It's not counterintuitive either. It's just like a very abstract claim that most people have probably never thought about before. And to figure out whether we should accept it, we have to think through the implications. So I don't think it's really intuitive or counterintuitive. It's just like an abstract claim that we have to think through. And then once we think through that, I find that claim highly implausible. So let's imagine that you have a 10-year-old and a 60-year-old and both have the same life expectancy, okay? So for whom is death worse, according to deprivationism? If they have the same number of years to live, and let's assume that the quality of those years are comparable. Yeah, well, I mean, if they have the same number of years to live and what those years would look like are not just comparable, but identically good for them, or would be identically good for them, then uh, the deprivation view would entail that each of their deaths are equally extrinsically bad. Do you think that deprivationism provides the strongest argument in favor of something like physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia? Um, no, I don't think it actually provides an argument for or against euthanasia. 
I think it can best capture the judgments that underlie cases in which we think euthanasia is in the interests of the being being euthanized and in cases in which it's against the interests of the being being euthanized. Um, but the reason that I said I don't think it really functions as an argument is that alternative accounts of the badness of death, so Epicureanism, for instance, every contemporary Epicurean, as far as I can tell, at least those that have published on the issue, will say, you know, murder is still wrong, for instance, if you're killing someone who would live a good life or who doesn't want to die, uh, in virtue of the fact that they would continue to live a happy life. And euthanasia could be good for beings in cases in which their self life would be really, really bad. So in that case, I think um, the arguments for or against euthanasia at bottom come down to the questions about what sorts of counterfactual and moral considerations bear on whether we should let people prematurely end their lives. And that is largely neutral with respect to what the correct account of the prudential badness of death is. And the reason it's largely neutral is that however you want to use the terms good for or bad for, you can sort of capture what I think of as the judgments that people want to make about when euthanasia is justified and when it's not. So, so I think it's just, it's like neutral between these. But nevertheless, it, it makes sense of the kind of terms that people use colloquially to discuss wh whether euthanasia is justified or not. So take, take a case of non-human animals again. I know it's more contentious with humans, but I think almost universally people think when they have pets that are suffering a great deal of physical pain that significantly detracts from the quality of life, uh, that the humane thing to do, that's the word that's often used, is to have those pets euthanized like for their benefit. And the thought is often just something like, they don't put it in these terms, but something like, well, if we keep them alive, they're going to just suffer and then die. And that's worse for them than going out of existence now by being killed. So I think these, I think deprivation is sort of underlying the judgments that they're making. It sort of makes sense of the terms that they use when they say something like, you know, I had to take my cat to the vet to euthanize it for its own sake. It's good for it. I think that deprivation sort of captures that. Um, but I don't see that as like an argument for or against euthanizing. I think it's really like these terms are sort of argument for the deprivationist use of bad for being the correct correct use of the term bad for. Uh, if that if that makes sense. I feel like I just sort of rambled in response to your question, but uh, but that's where I, I land on that issue. Maybe the reason why I think something like deprivationism can provide a good argument for something like physician assisted suicide and euthanasia is because when, at least when people defend it, the way that they're defending it has a deprivationist flavor to it. You know, it's that, it, you know, they'll, they'll think about their future suffering and they don't want to continue suffering. Like the arguments in yeah. favor of these practices seem to be based on well-being judgments, right? That are also based on deprivationist judgments, right? Like it is worse for me to continue to suffer. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's largely right. I just, um, I guess I'm hesitant to call that deprivationist judgments. I mean, so like an Epicurean can say the same thing and say, well, it would be really terrible for you to continue to suffer or it'd be really terrible for this pet to continue to suffer. So we should euthanize it. I know I said earlier, like when, once they say that, they're just really saying the same thing that the deprivationist is saying. They're just using the terms good for and bad for different. I would 100% agree that the considerations that the deprivationist takes into account with respect to what determines the badness of death on their view, that those considerations are the morally important considerations or among the morally important considerations where we determine or ask questions about whether euthanasia is justified for humans or non-human animals. Like the things that they're looking at <laughs> that, consider, that concerns them about the badness of death, that's what at least the main thing we should be looking at when we're thinking about the ethics of euthanasia. Yeah. And I mean, the way that I think about it as well is from the perspective of the purpose of medicine, right? Like, what is the goal if it's not to improve human well-being? You know, you definitely don't want to decrease human well-being, right? You want to heal, you want to save people's lives. But underlying that goal is the assumption that healing improves your well-being and that saving your life is good for you. Right. They're all they're yeah. all grounded in well-being claims. Right. 
So if it's the case that it's good for someone to die, right? I don't see how that is inconsistent with the goals of medicine. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think a lot of physicians just anecdotally uh, will say something like, well, I took the Hippocratic Oath and that is really about extending life. And I think the thing that you just put your finger on is, well, that should matter insofar as it contributes to your overall well-being. But of course, you shouldn't want to extend your life if it's going to make your life, at least necessarily make your life much worse for you. And we all have these judgments when it comes to euthanasia for non-human animals. Um, but then when it comes to humans, a lot of people just seem to automatically assume that additional life is necessarily good for you. Um, but that's very hard to square on any account of well-being. I mean, just to any, it's not just like assuming hedonism. It's the hedonism, desire satisfaction is various perfectionist views, uh, various objective list theories. It's on all of those views, there's going to be cases where your subsequent life would be on the whole bad for you. And it's not clear why medicine should be concerned with extending your life in those cases. So I, I don't think the debate over physician assisted suicide or euthanasia is about well-being. I don't think that's where the legitimate debate is. I think the legitimate debate is over whether or not it's morally permissible. Yeah, right. That's really interesting. I mean, yeah. So then the question is like, well, what's the correct normative ethical view? And whatever the correct view is, one of the things that's going to help determine the deontic status of the physician performing the act that results in the death of their patient is going to be well-being considerations, but that needn't be the only consideration. The other question is, well, if, you, if you're doing something that hypothetically is not bad for the patient, and we can suppose not all things considered bad for others, then on what grounds would it be wrong? And you could have various views that are typically categorized as deontological that could generate those judgments. Um, but that, that really is a part of where the action is, so to speak. It's like, well, what's the argument for those views and why would it entail in this case that this harmless act by hypothesis, harmless act is in fact wrong. Yeah, that's a good point. I was discussing an interesting case with one of my friends, and the case was of this elderly woman. I don't remember how old, but let's say that she's like 65, okay? And she's suffering from dementia, and she doesn't remember anybody, okay? And it's to the point where if somebody just comes into the room, she thinks that she's being robbed. So she's constantly scared and constantly uh, panicking. And she also happens not to be able to walk. So when she gets freaked out, she starts yelling, screaming, throwing stuff. And then she'll start crawling on the floor, you know, yelling for help. Okay. And that's just her existence. Right. And I think anybody who faces that type of situation would think, oh man, this person is like really suffering. You know, like this, like there is more negative well-being in her life than positive well-being. And you may think that it would be good for her to die because of that, right? However, she wants to live, right? So then it becomes a case where I do think that it would be morally wrong to euthanize her because it's against her will, even though I can agree that it's good for her to die. What do you think about yeah. that case? Yeah. So I don't know what to think about this. There's a few things that I think we have to hone in on to try to even answer the moral question. So one thing that you said was that she wants to live. And like one question we could ask is, did she have a preference before she started having dementia about what she would want in this case? And how strong was that preference? Um, what does the preference of wanting to live amount to now? How It's not obvious to me that her well-being level would be negative, even in these horrible circumstances. She's suffering terribly, but I have to know like, what is her life like at the times that she's not fearing for her life and thinking that someone's going to rob her. And I, I mean, we can stipulate in the hypothetical case that there's uh, not enough well-being to balance out that ill-being so that it comes out net negative. We can ask, I mean, there's a question about like whether respecting her autonomy, so you appeal to her autonomous decisions as a reason for thinking that it's immoral to do what 
my hypothesis is going to be good for her. And we can ask whether that having your autonomy respected is a function of well-being or not, right? So, so some people think it's bad for her to have her autonomy thwarted, even if she's suffering more than she's getting pleasure. And if that's true, and you give having your autonomy uh, respected enough weight, you you would get the verdict that her death would be bad for her, even on deprivation view. And even if she's suffering more than she is getting pleasure in life. Um, or you can say, well, it's not a component of well-being. It's just a moral consideration that factors in the criterion of right for you know third parties. So you, it'd be morally wrong to violate someone's autonomy, even when it's in their own interest. But then you have to say weird things like, if you do something that is good for you and everyone else, and most beneficial for the person that you're doing the thing to, it's wrong if it violates their autonomy, even though violating their autonomy is not bad for them or anyone else. And that raises the question of like, well, why would, if, if autonomy is not a function of your well-being, why is it bad morally to violate it? If it's not bad for that person or anyone else, like why would it be bad to violate it? But then lastly, like as a matter of public policy, you certainly don't want to build in that autonomy can be thwarted in cases in which it would be in someone's interest. Because of course, that's going to just be rife with abuse. Well, when I think about ethics in general, I kind of reduce it to two basic values. And one is well-being and the other is autonomy. Now, I think oftentimes that they overlap, but I don't think that they necessarily have to. And I because that they don't necessarily have to, like, I think they're actually two separate concepts. That's why I, I, I make a distinction between, you know, prudential goodness and, and moral goodness. And when it comes to a case like euthanasia for someone who wants to continue living, I see a conflict there. You know, like, even if I were to believe that it would be better for this old lady to die, I still think it would be wrong to euthanize her against your wishes. And even if you were to tell me that she isn't fully autonomous because her dementia is so advanced, as long as she can express some sort of preference, I think it would be wrong to kill her. And I think it comes down to the fact that I think autonomy is separate from well-being. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Well, let me ask you about a uh, converse case, though. Do you think it would be wrong to prevent someone from killing themselves when you, let's say, justifiably believe, and I'll suppose your belief is true in this case, that it would be bad for them to kill themselves. Yeah. There's psychological studies that show that people very frequently who are, who are young and make decisions to commit suicide, uh, I, I want to say like impulsively, that's not the right word, but it's like a no, it's, it's like it's impulsive. decision to make quickly that then if you stop them from committing suicide, they'll often come to be very glad that you did. Right. So, I mean, I don't know what your account of autonomy is, but I wonder whether stopping someone from committing suicide would be a violation of their autonomy and whether you think it would thus be wrong to do that, even in uh, specific cases in which you know it would be good for them to prevent them from killing themselves. Yeah. No, I mean, those are tricky questions. Again, like I have a general answer, but I think you can easily poke holes in, in my justifications for the answer. So if, I mean, this was actually a case I had to do with at the hospital. Like it was a uh, young woman, she was dying of breast cancer and uh, she was suffering from a lot of pain. And so she attempted suicide by swallowing a bunch of opioids. Okay. And her husband found her in bed and then called the ambulance. So now she's in an emergency department and she's still awake enough to communicate. And she tells the doctor to let her die, not to reverse the overdose. You know, like, don't give me Narcan. And then that's when that doctor, again, like, page me. And for cases of attempted suicide, according to the data, most people who attempt suicide don't reattempt, right? And attempts are impulsive. They spend less than five right. minutes, less than five minutes uh, thinking about the attempt before actually committing the act. So that tells me that that's not really what they want. Most of the time, that is not really what they want. Now, if it were the case that, you know, death would be good for somebody, and death is really what they want, I would be totally in favor of, you know, something like physician-assisted suicide. But it's when those two things conflict, it gets tricky. Yeah. So let's say death is bad for this particular patient, but it's what she really wanted. I mean, I mean, there's a clinical ethics answer that I would give, which is not to, you know, euthanize her, not to, you know, allow physician-assisted suicide for that case. But the philosophical answer is not so clear, you know? 
I, I would want to know more. Like, why does she not want to continue living? Does she believe that death would, would be good for her or bad for her? Like, I would want to know that, right? Because there might be some, uh, perhaps a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of how her life can improve. Yeah, right, right, right. Because it just doesn't seem rational for someone who's autonomous to want to die if they believe that death is bad for them, right? Unless, you know, they're sacrificing their own life to save other people. If you tell me that somebody's fully autonomous, uh, I think part of that is that they're acting rationally and they can weigh the pros and cons of different options and stuff like that, right? So it, it almost seems to be theoretically inconsistent. If you think death is bad for you, and uh, and you're fully rational and you're fully like uh, knowledgeable about what what that decision entails, you know, and then you still want it. That seems weird. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you have to build an additional assumption that like you should all else equal want the thing that's best for you. But that seems that seems possible to me too. Although it's contentious. Yeah, I mean, so where I come down on this is from a public policy perspective. I think ignoring people's wishes when they're trying to end their life in most cases is going to be good for them. Whereas if you try to legally allow people to override others' decisions that they want to continue to live, like if you try to build in cases in which you can ignore someone's desire to continue living, then that is going to result in abuse that's going to be really bad for people. So again, it's just going to have worse outcomes from a consequentialist perspective. I also am concerned about moral uncertainty. So like I mentioned earlier, I am inclined towards accepting hedonism as the correct account of well-being. But like I don't know that desire satisfactionism is false. I'm very uncertain about that. What I think I ought to do practically uh, is take my moral uncertainty into account when making these decisions. So there's a question about like what's the morally right thing to do. And then there's a question about in light of my moral ignorance about various issues, what should I do in this current state that I'm in? And I think that can favor this asymmetry between the two. And I care about autonomy, but I care about it insofar as it contributes to well-being. Um, but if we're imagining cases where it's it's taken into account, but it's still good for the people in question to have their autonomy thwarted, then I'm not so clear on why morally it would why that would matter. Uh, in terms of changing the deotic status of an act from morally permissible to impermissible. Just uh, if it's if it's good, like here's what seems like a very plausible moral principle to me. If some act is optimistic for you and everyone else who's deserving, then it's morally permissible to perform that act. And you, it seems like the way that you're thinking about autonomy, you have to deny that in cases in which the act in question that's optimistic for you and everyone else that matters morally and deserves the good in question it would still violate someone's autonomy then you have to say that that's more they want to do and that that seems like a weird moral principle to give up but if you build autonomy into considerations of well-being or into considerations of moral uncertainty um then i think you could accept that what i think of as a very plausible moral axiom and still get the still get the verdicts that you want in these sort of in at least the typical cases that that you've talked about yeah, no, I, I do think autonomy just has its own separate value. Can't really explain why. I think it just helps explain the intuitions that I have in particular cases. And I don't build autonomy into uh, my account of well-being. Although, like, I think realistically they overlap, right? But I think theoretically they're, they're distinct. Uh, but yeah. Do you think it's always wrong to violate autonomy? Or do you think if the well-being at stake is high enough... It can be more than permissible to violate someone's autonomy for their own good. If we're working with a more comprehensive account of autonomy, I'm not so sure. That that's that's a tough one for me. I would need to know more of the details. But if we're talking about somebody's preferences, which uh, you know, somebody who's not fully autonomous can can express preferences, that yeah, sometimes I, I I do think it's justified to override the preferences, like somebody who is not not thinking straight, right? And, you know, sometimes we, we do that. We hold people at the hospital. Yeah. I mean, so this, this bears on that initial description of the case too. You said that this person has dementia, but wants to live. Yes. In another suicide case, you said, well, you have to imagine that they like really want it. And the empirical literature shows that like most people, excluding terminally ill people who attempt suicide, tend not to do it again and then to be glad 
uh, that they continue living. You said, well, so the, the weird case is one where someone thinks that their life would be good for them, but they really like truly want it. And I want to know, like, what's this account of like truly wanting and why would someone with advanced dementia, like how would they meet these, how would they satisfy these conditions of truly wanting to live in spite of the um, perspective life being on the whole bad by hypothesis? Yeah, no, those are great questions. I, I wish I had the answers to them. You know, it's, it's almost like on the one hand, the only thing I want to value is full autonomy. The wish is expressed by fully autonomous Cajun. But on the other hand, even if this person just wants it a little bit, you know, like e- even if this minimally autonomous person expresses this wish, then we need to, re- to, to respect it. Right. It seems to be inconsistent in, in, in that case. That's that's the worry. That's the tension. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, like the more factors that are relevant, the more difficult it's going to be because it, it, yeah. there's just theoretically more variation. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in regard to the value of someone's choice, I would say that more value is placed on it, the more autonomously it was made. And then you have the well-being aspect too, right? Yeah. So then you have the different levels of autonomy, and then you have uh, the well-being factor. And then sometimes these two things conflict, and most of the time they don't, right? But then the interesting and difficult ethical cases arises when they conflict, right? Yeah. So like how much, like what if this decision is going to lead to a lot of suffering, but you know, it was made sort of autonomously, like, you know, like which one outweighs the other. And yeah, right. I, I don't have an answer to that. Yeah, I don't either. But it is more complicated, as you acknowledge, when you try to think of autonomy as a separate domain of something that's morally relevant rather than, you know, morally relevant insofar as it contributes to well-being itself or is a uh, intrinsic good for people's well-being. If it's a separate domain, then it gets it gets even more complicated to make these trade-offs no absolutely um well i think it's a good time to wrap things up thank you so much for having this conversation with me yeah thanks so much for having me on it's been uh, a lot of fun